I'm Dan. And I'm Alex. And this is the On Air Podcast. Welcome back, everyone. What's Welcome up, back. Alex? As have you been back to LA this week? What's going on? I thought I'll give a week off for the LA routine. <laughs> you know, I don't want to have you throwing it to me in the first 30 seconds of every podcast. I know, it's getting but a bit old. I imagine your travels around Southeast Asia, the Far East, have continued. They, yeah, they've continued. They have been amazing. I'm almost embarrassed to say where we are now because we're just moving so quickly week by week. This is just the best place in the world to travel, in mine and Oscar's opinion. I actually, we got a comment on one of our podcast episodes on YouTube that I was like, this is great because someone said, you know, I love the aviation content, guys, but I also wouldn't mind if this podcast became more California, avocado toast, politics, that type of fun stuff. Really? So, yeah. So I was like, perfect. Because now we have one person has given us a pass the to talk about the most random stuff we want. The thing is, it, we did always say that that when we would have these long phone calls to catch up on what we were doing, we were wondering, is this what the podcast would be like? Yeah. And, and so on and so on. <laughs> but you just mentioned, and I'll now pick pick this up because this is something you told me, but you did not tell me on the podcast. Am I correct in saying VIP suite at Frankfurt Airport, which is a service you can pay for, is creating a menu in your honor? Oh, God. I don't like to speak before something is official, but it could be happening that soon Avocado Toast will be officially nonstop Dan branded. So take that, Angelino. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you want Avocado Toast in the lounge, it might be a part of nonstop Dan's breakfast, but it may not happen, guys. So I'm, I'm not getting my hopes up until I see it in person, but there's talk that Maybe avocado toast, acai bowls. It will all be part of nonstop dance. So this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is ridiculous. The sooner that we we find maybe the new season of the podcast, maybe from like episode ten onwards, we rebrand as the Alex Macheros Show featuring <laughs> Dan, and then you can just show up from time to time when you're not bothering us about these these new woke developments like acai bowls <laughs> and avocado toast in Frankfurt Airport. Did you ever hear such a, a two phrases that don't go together? Oh my... Frankfurt Airport. I think of low ceilings, drizzly rain. <laughs> Alex, delays and stop. strikes and <laughs> you said last toast week. and acai. I think of sunshine and warmth and, and tans and things like this. Uh, th this is a mess. Alex uh, has a vendetta for some reason against Frankfurt Airport. As I said before, I take the side of protecting them. It's realistic. The, the layout is not ideal, but I have never had the type of delays I have in London there, for example. And the VIP services, which may soon have a nonstop Dan menu, are pretty amazing and some of the cheapest in Europe. So that is worth What a man. Out. A man of the people, Dan. <laughs> I'm so relatable. <laughs> Forget the terminal. Not, uh, Use VIP services. <laughs> there is so much context that maybe listeners do not know, which is that I am sure, and you deny this, which is just in my eyes, hysterical, but I am sure that the very origins of your YouTube name, the, the now successful channel that is quote, nonstop Dan, was oh, no. a complete copy paste plagiarist theft from Lufthansa, who <laughs> until quite recently, their tagline was nonstop you. So I think you, growing up as a kid, were like, nonstop you. We know that you grew up on Lufthansa. This is very well documented. You were definitely a fanboy of the, you know, the German flag carrier. And now your whole brand is the former. And nobody talks about, you don't even talk about this. Am I wrong? <laughs> you are completely wrong. I was thinking about a new name because I hated my old name, which thank you for not mentioning it here. And if you do mention it, I will delete <laughs> that part. So I was thinking. So let, the, like, let the listeners know now that I have just said it 10 times, but he's cut it out. Go on. He has not said it a single time, thankfully. So I was thinking for about six months to a year about what I was going to call my channel. And I was narrowing in on Destination Dan because I wanted alliteration, but I was like, this sounds more like a travel vlogging channel. It doesn't sound like it's really aviation. And it sounds a bit, okay, nonstop Dan can also sound a bit full of itself, I understand, but destination Dan is like, whoa, this is, this sounds really self-obsessed. 
So Destination Dan sounds like my idea of of hell. So it sounds <laughs> like it sounds like fire festival meets this oh. kind of all inclusive place with lukewarm beverages <laughs> and an open buffet that has been under hot lamps since twelve, <laughs> and it's all part of the Destination Dan package. I think. Thank God you spared well, us from such a reality. Lucky it is not that. But the time I th- actually thought about my name, or I thought of my name, my existing name, because I had already even made the branding for Destination Dan. I had had the logo done, everything. Oh, and I, wow. I was alone walking around Bangkok because Oscar was doing an internship in Japan. So I was, I had just landed from, oh my gosh, from New York. So I'd flown across the world just left my hotel which in those days i was staying at some like 25 dollar a night pretty rustic hotel i walked along the street and i thought when did i last sleep like how many days ago did i sleep my life is so non-stop and then i was like wait a minute so you may be right that it was subconscious and somehow the word non-stop then came from lufthansa but even at the time i wasn't flying lufthansa much and it was subconscious in that case. I thought of it for a completely different reason. So I hope that my name does not originate from Lufthansa's slogan because anyone knows. And- Dan, it does. <laughs> it does. Okay. The, the tagline, okay. Lufthansa's global slogan for decades was nonstop you. You read it and you were like, nonstop you. Me, I am Dan. Nonstop Dan. That's the channel. At the uh, time. Uh, th- listen, the Bangkok story was no all very noble. Stuff. It was it was very noble. It was very nice. But it's, please, please, Dan, it was Lufthansa. I will not admit it because it's not true. Even this week, I've been all over the newspapers in Switzerland. Well, maybe not the physical ones, but all over their media for trashing Swiss business class. You know, me and Lufthansa Group, we're not besties for the past year or so. Yeah, because That's you stole that slogan. <laughs> Watch them come sue me now. Then I'll I'll be seeing you in court, Alex. I'm calling Karsten Schwor and I'm just making sure <laughs> that he's aware. Interesting that you've been in the media though in Switzerland. How do you usually find out when a video has made waves like that? Do you Viewers get send it to me, How yeah. It so this time right. I, I got one. Actually, someone commented on the post announcing the podcast. So I think even you might be able to see that in your notifications. I was like, okay, yeah, cool. But then I went to my DM, my message requests, and it was spammed with Swiss people going, Dan, you're in Switzerland's biggest media. They're writing about you. So I was like, anytime that happens, I don't like it, especially when it's a critical review. I'm like, "Mm, not this is going straight on some forum where people <laughs> love to say oh, nasty yeah. stuff. The dark web. The dark the web. Dark Never web. read the comments. Yeah. Um, Do you ever think... Well, that's... I, I just want to have a, a bit of a discu- short discussion about when you're in the public eye to any extent, there's always people who mm. like you and dislike you. So sometimes mm. I catch people like glancing my way a lot it seems like they might know who i am no 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 in person oh in person okay so people of course people approach me they say they like my videos but then when i see people glancing i start thinking like this person probably knows who i am but actually hates me (laughs) so they're just they're staring but you know they're like that SOB. And just before coming to record this, I was in the elevator or I was getting in the elevator and there's this guy holding a baby with and, and his wife. He's not holding his wife, but his wife was there. And he's like staring <laughs> at me really weird. And then I, I look at him. I'm like, hi. And he's like, never mind. And I'm like, <gasps> okay. Uh, what? Are, so I was like, we're speaking Swedish. If you were wondering, I said, he's like, no, no, no. I knew it was Swedish. I'm just wondering, how is it that I've never run into any of my favorite aviation YouTubers before? And now I finally ran into you. So I was like, okay, so (laughs) it was a viewer. I was relieved that it wasn't some hostile interaction. Have you ever had any... I mean, we've spoken about this before, haven't we? About, you know, the thing is, when you are in the public domain, be it by... So you, of course, people consume you as an individual via YouTube. For me, it's 
a little bit more targeted in terms of how you'd be able to catch me on air because you'd have to be watching at that exact moment on TV when I come on for, for news and similar with radio. And then, of course, all the other bits and pieces that are around that. But of course, and we've spoken about it also while we were growing up, you know, we were young and I was working and also you were doing your YouTube thing. And that caused the whole wave of, you know, forums and Twitter things and whatever. I think I've always been quite good at knowing that there is a reason why people say avoid the comment sections, because they are often from people that not only do they not know you, they have no idea about you whatsoever. So why you would take into account or take to heart the opinion of a total stranger who, who assumes that they know you for X, Y, Z, when actually they're just consuming you in 30 second bites, be it via an Instagram story or on TV where, and on TV, I'm not talking about anything to do with me in the slightest. I would be yeah. discussing something in the industry. So I always just think that in real life, when you meet real people, it's just, thankfully, an overwhelmingly positive experience. Yeah. And I think that's true for everyone in society. I mean, as there are examples, and I know I've told you before, where I have met people, people have come up to me in an airport lounge or blah, blah, blah. And they, you know, they get to, they, we start speaking. And it's only happened once or twice where a guy literally said to me, he said, after the five, 10 minute conversation, oh, it was really great to meet you and speak with you about this. He said, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't like you at all. I didn't think you were nice. He said, but, but you're actually like really too. nice. And, uh, oh. and I was like, okay, well, thanks, I, I guess. I mean, you know, you assumed before, but, but also, I would never, I would never judge someone that I simply do not know. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is the hilarious point. And this is where you can very easily begin to detach from these comments or from tweets or things like this from those that you don't know, because I have seen and read tweets and threads where they say, you know, how did he start working so young? And then someone will reply, well, when you know who his father is, it all makes sense. And, and, and I, will, I will send it a screenshot to my father and we'll be in hysterics. Yeah. Who, who are you? I don't know. I'm saying to my father, do you have something? Because they seem to know that you're my connection in aviation. So are you? And you didn't tell me. And my father, who you know doesn't know anything about aviation, no link whatsoever, entirely different industry that doesn't cross over at all so it's it's funny yeah when I, when you see that you think okay most 99.99999 percent of the time these people are unqualified to begin with in terms of their knowledge of you so don't take anything they say about you to heart yeah the thing that you learn over time working i hate to say in the public eye but whatever on social media where where there's many people being exposed to you is that it's a job. And whether you're a YouTuber or on TV, mm. you are portraying a specific side of your personality or something is coming out that doesn't paint a full picture because it's impossible, whatever it is, to convey who you are as a person and your full range of opinions. So if I see, of course, of course. you know, if I see a YouTube video and I'm like, if, and my initial reaction is that I don't like that person, I reserve judgment and I don't let myself think I don't like this person. I just think this is this person's yeah. job. They are doing their best just as my, I'm doing my best to make entertaining, interesting content. So until you've met someone and spoken with them, you can't go around judging people on wherever it may be just because they happen to do their job where tons of people can see it. Exactly. And, and that's, that's, that's the important bit to remember, you are consuming someone in a, in a certain context, and, and not you're not knowing them, you haven't met them, you're not having an interaction with them. I sure. have to say, draw it back to Frankfurt Airport VIP services. I spent yeah. pretty much a full day there. So my personal VIP agent, everyone gets one. I was asking her, you know, I was very interested, which celebrities have you personally had that you have been, yeah. you've been their agent, you've driven them around, you've spoken to them, which one, which big ones have you had? So she's like, she's, she mumbled something and then she was like Jay-Z and Beyonce. So we're like, ah, yeah, you've never had Jay-Z and Beyonce. Oh, wow. Those are your dream. And she's like, no, 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 I've had them twice. And we're like, oh, and then she's like, they're the nicest people I have ever met. And then she goes on to tell us what conversations they had and how engaged they were. And that just made me think how when you're at that level of stardom, every interaction is so important. It must be exhausting because imagine they've just played shows, they're tired, they're about to hop on a 10-hour flight, 
And then they have to be super nice to every person they meet because that will spread. If they even give a slightly salty or, you know, insensitive comment, everyone will know about it. But now that we hear from her that they were so nice. We're like, yeah, Jay-Z and Beyonce are really nice and friendly. Fun anecdote about Jay-Z before he had met Beyonce. So growing up, when I say growing up, let's say around four or five, we lived in London, very, very close, basically next to BBC Studios. And Jay-Z started in, in in a restaurant, in a lunch place outside, started talking with my mother and was talking with her and talking with her and explaining how he was in town for Top of the Pops, which was the (laughs) mainstream kind of show where you would debut your new music. My mum had no idea who he was. I mean, he wasn't obviously anywhere near as big as he is today. And Jay-Z was asking if me and my sister were, if we were twins and yeah, and he picked me up and there's a photo and he put me on his knee and he was talking with me and like, you know, like trying to instigate conversation with me and sp- speaking with my mum, gave my mum his number and <laughs> and then left. And the funny part is whenever we remember this story, we always look at Beyonce and then we turn to my mum and we're like, that could have been you. You, yeah. you realise that you, <laughs> you, you could, could have been, been Blue Ivy, <laughs> <Yeah>. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but let's reserve that one for Demi. But yeah. still, yeah. <laughs> we say we say to my mum, we're like, you would have just finished a Renaissance tour. Just imagine you and mom <laughs> so, up there on Stallone. <laughs> they do have sim- They do have similar hair colour, but <laughs> they anyway, do. And now I know your mom. He, maybe can he dance has a type. That video from last <laughs> week. <laughs> Moving on, I wanted to bring to your attention this interesting little development that simmers in the background of international air travel and I always find interesting when I see it kind of flare up from time to time which is how as a general flying public the public can mix up destinations often through no fault of their own and the example I'll give you here is that most people when booking flights these days will be going on to a price comparison website something like Skyscanner and they'll be searching the destination. Where am I going? I'm going to Valencia, and they hit enter. And it will say 300 pounds, let's say. It's talking British pounds, and okay, that's a bit expensive, or that's not too bad, it includes luggage. And and now go ahead and book. Well, there are many places on earth (laughs) that the destinations are mixed up with the same name, and so you get quite a significant number. I'd say this, I think the official number is, it happens to a few hundred passengers a year in total on collectively in total that's pretty on all different areas of the world yeah where they end up flying to the wrong place so 100 people per year arrive in austria having booked to travel to australia (laughs) yeah like wow australia is very german A, a more extreme version but it does happen and you can understand why every year there are passengers that are booked to fly to Granada in Spain and end up in Grenada in the Caribbean (laughs) and those that book to travel to Grenada in the Caribbean and end up in Granada in Spain. That one is the difference of ultimately one letter. So Grenada instead of Granada. I'm really surprised that like you're talking about countries, but I was thinking, okay, people book a flight to London, but they end up in London, Ontario, for example, which also gets quite a few. Oh, like, yeah, that's those a good are one. the types of things that I would one. expect people to go to the wrong place. Well, when you're flying to Grenada, you're flying to Grenada as an airport to, that serves the whole island. When you're flying to Granada, you're obviously flying to a Spanish city. It happens again. And I, I think the common theme here is that Spain has got a lot to answer for <laughs> with, with this because Santiago. So there are two. There is Santiago de Compostela. So Santiago in Spain. And obviously Santiago as in the capital of Chile in South America. Yeah, I'm so surprised it's not more common because one thing, I've seen adults do this, but when I was younger, I remember so distinctly the first time I saw a booking when we were going from Sweden to the to New York to visit my dad. And I was looking at the schedule and I, w- I thought, how is it possible that we take off at 10 a.m. and land at 1 p.m., but it's an eight-hour flight? I was just, my yeah. brain could not comprehend how at that age... How is it just three hours yet eight hours? So I was telling my dad, did you book flights to the right New York? So I'm sure that's part (laughs) of it where people think, 
They look Definitely. at the time. Like if you're flying from London to Spain and London to somewhere on the east in the east coast of the U.S., you can land. You can take off at 10 and land at the same time in the destination, yeah. which makes it even 100%. more one hundred percent. And and also, don't forget. Okay, and I only really, re I only really realize this when, for example, Jimmy Kimmel does those segments where he stands on the street with a world map and he's like, point yeah. to <laughs> Africa. And, and and nobody can do it. No. And it's like, oh, my goodness. Actually, the basic knowledge, geographical knowledge of the world is pretty limited. It's not yeah. so surprising that, that most people have either no idea specifically where they're going to in terms of being able to point to it on a map or what continent it belongs to and so on and so on. I mean, geography, I don't know what happened in all those geography classes where people were growing <laughs> up. I loved geography, yeah, Lee, but, uh, but it's funny how, you know, you, you see it in reality TV when they start. Okay, ready? Dan, what's the capital of Australia? Ca Canberra. What a horrible pronunciation, Canberra. That accent, that, that okay. What's Canberra. the capital of, uh, I can't believe we're doing this, but we are. What is You're just the trying to quiz me to of... make me say something wrong. Alex, Canada. what's the capital? The capital of Canada is Ottawa. Alex, what is the okay. capital of Mali? The capital of Mali is... Google's it. Oh, the... I've lost you. <laughs> Convenient. No, Hello? you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, okay. I know the capital of Mali, okay? okay. The capital of Mali... <laughs> this... <laughs> this reminds me of when... Have you watched Friends? <laughs> Have you watched? No, but I need to sit. Wait, 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 wait. We're not moving on. Okay. okay. It begins with a B. It begins with a B. The capital of Mali begins with a B. Okay. Now even I'm, I've confused myself. Is it Bamako? That's what I'm thinking. Yes. I'm checking. I'm checking. Capital of Mali. Wait, search. Mali, capital of Bamako. Woohoo! Woo! Yeah. Woo. Okay. There we go. Well, good job. That's you, good. You've watched Friends, right? Yes. One of the key hilarious moments for me is when Chandler is trying to escape Janice to the point where he says he has to move abroad. So he just ran to Yemen. Out Yemen. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, <laughs> and then it's like, oh, but Chandler, I want to write you. And then it's like, what's your oh, address? No. And then he goes like, one Yemen road, Yemen. And that's just, <laughs> it cracks me up because that is literally how so many, even people in my American family think about the rest of the world. One thing I wanted to say, I think is much more common than booking a flight to the wrong city is going to the wrong airport in the city oh you're in. Oh my God, that happens. Con I mean, that happens to thousands and thousands of passengers all over the world every year. Again, only not only day, friends. Like hundreds a day, not I guess. But, but airlines are not very clear, and I don't sometimes no. blame passengers. I mean, you can you can do a, a booking via London, and it's just slightly mentioned that the next flight actually departs from London Gatwick. So yes. I hope you have allowed an hour and 30 minutes minimum on the M25, one of the worst motorways in the UK, to go from one airport to the other. It's <laughs> such a big thing. And yet they're like, and this airport is going to be a different one when you take this next flight. So we hope yeah. But do you want to add car insurance? <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, yeah, just yesterday, flying out of Thailand, we were checking in. And at the desk next to us, for context, in Bangkok, every single time you tell a taxi you're going to an airport, even in like a Grab, which is their Uber, they ask you which airport. Is it BKK or DMK? They really want you to know. So it's supposed to be impossible to get it wrong. Still, as we're checking in at the service desk next to us, there's two Russian women around our age who are like, we were supposed to fly from the other airport to Phuket. Our flight leaves in one hour. Can you book us a new flight from here for free? Let us change. This is Air Asia. So I'm like, mm, good luck with that. But the staff is yeah. discussing. And these girls just seemed completely clueless about the fact that there even were two airports. They had apparently shown up to check in and <laughs> mm. had no idea what was going on. So... In the end, I kind of lingered to hear what happened. And I think they said, you have to oh buy a new my ticket. Oh, my God. <laughs> we just spoke about lobby lizards, didn't we? Wasn't that? In, and, uh, but I was and, so uh, curious to see. Gate louse. <laughs> I was curious. Is there any sympathy or 
Yeah. I mean, of course, especially at a low cost airline, that's not how it yeah, works. No. Unfortunately, yeah. I think they had to pay again. The funny part is, is that this also links to friends because wasn't the last episode where one of them was at Newark yes. and the other one was at JFK? No, didn't they? They went to prevent Rachel from moving, but they went to the wrong airport, yes. I think. They went to JFK and that's, she was flying yeah. from Newark. I mean, as yeah, an ab geek, I in. don't think it yeah. gets better than there's a problem with the left phalange. No. It is gold. I know. All these iconic scenes on aircraft are all this same set of a Boeing 767 in a 222 <laughs> configuration. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's Riot just Beast always... Too everyone's the exact same. Yeah. They're all using this same Warner Brothers studio, kind of like LA, yeah. Sony studio. And then from the outside, it's like an A380 or something. Nothing infuriates me more. And it's funny because nothing infuriates me more than the inconsistencies. I'm always staggered how movies and TV series are multi-million dollar projects. And yet they haven't hired one person who can say, guys, that is is an image of an A320 and we just showed them boarding an A380. So <laughs> yeah. we need to have a little bit, you know, I get it, triple seven to, you know, seven, six, seven, I can kind of let it slide or whatever. But it's, it just amazes me the oversight. It's, it has got a yeah. bit better, but it was funny because I walked past the TV yesterday in the evening, my, my mum was watching something. And as I walked past, I, I literally, the moment I walked past the screen, a Cathay Pacific A330 was landing and I said, Oh, what are you watching set in Hong Kong? And she was like, no, it's not set in Hong Kong. She said, it's a, it's a 70s <laughs> drama set in Scotland. I, was, I said, well, oh, that God. was a cafe, A330. She was like, really? So. Yeah, that, those do not fly to Scotland. Warner Brothers, if you're listening, I would identify the planes for free if I was in the credits. So just putting that Agreed. out there. Agreed. So... In the news and in, in the world of aviation, there has been a lot going on, as always. But this was something that caught my eye because it was something that I was able to take to Twitter, now known as X, exclusively. But also, it's just interesting because of the aircraft that this gentleman has. So, Gentle. the Sultan of Brunei, I mean, okay, I'll be respectful. The Sultan of <laughs> Brunei, who is, of course, the head of state for Brunei, conducted a an official state visit to France earlier in the week. And on the Saturday, he flew from Paris to Toulouse. And remember, this is France that is now actively passing legislation to reduce domestic flights because of the carbon impact. The Sultan of Brunei was permitted and able to fly on a huge Boeing 747-8, which is commonly referred to in aviation, his one, as the Flying Palace, because it is his aircraft. It's the Sultan of Brunei's plane. It is absolutely extravagant in terms of gold finishes, gold toilet roll holders, gold, you know, everything you can imagine. Okay, everything. And he flew this domestic flight from Paris to Toulouse because he initiated an official but private visit to Airbus indicating that some form of aircraft order is ahead. Now, whether or not that's for the commercial fleet, for example, of the airline Royal Brunei, or perhaps the Sultan of Brunei. And <laughs> this is, I mean, obviously something that both Airbus and Boeing will want to be able to secure and win because when this guy orders an aircraft, he goes all out these are flying palaces and what he had arrived to toulouse on is known as the flying palace but who knows this trip to airbus may indicate that there is maybe an a350 version of one coming up soon yeah. maybe he is looking at taking on a second hand a380 from the secondary market and having airbus kit it out in the way that they have with previous aircraft Let's he is see. he is rich rich oscar and i were in brunei about 10 months ago we flew royal brunei it was fascinating all i can say is that we have never been in a country where a leader is treated so much like a god mm. there's a whole museum built just about him it's really quite fascinating so i'm not surprised he's going to buy a big plane he, he, he's not without controversy of course and 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 that is you know often the case with the with these kind of states but the unbelievable part of it is is that specifically with him the extravagance when it comes to aviation and also his car collection 
is just insane. And I think that for Airbus to be able to secure him for the next gen aircraft, it won't just be a significant deal, you know, in terms of an aircraft order, but the customization process absolutely off the scale in terms <laughs> of what is possible now, which I think takes us into quite a nice topic that we have been asked a few times in the Q&A and we were planning on addressing, which is quite literally, how does one order a plane? How do I now go and then eventually end up with an aircraft that is my own if I am an airline or a private individual. And it's something that Dan and I have been involved in because, not least because, <laughs> yeah, we've, I mean, that's, we've that's how we met. Planes, if you guys didn't know. No, okay, not that way. I mean, we, we, we are yet to own, I mean, I do not own an aircraft. Do you own an aircraft, Dan? I do not. And I frankly don't plan on doing so either. I know, it's, it's ACMI, the whole wet leasing thing is just so much more convenient. But um, <laughs> the, uh, what I meant is we, we did actually meet on a delivery, which is the final part of, of ordering a plane. So when, when you want to order, you literally have a choice of the manufacturer, right? So you've got Airbus, you've got Boeing, but also you've got the other manufacturers that are a little bit on the quieter side. You have Embraer, for example. You have other manufacturers that yeah, are not China. able to... Yeah, that are not able to compete as well as they can do so right now, but maybe in the future, such as Comac, the Chinese aircraft manufacturer. You have options in Russia and so on and so on. But Airbus and Boeing really rule the world when it comes to, and that's why it's re referred to as a duopoly. And ultimately, when you've decided on your aircraft, it's then time to decide how you're going to kit out and fit out that aircraft. And that is the most incredible part i think of ordering a plane because it is literally the extravagant version of when you are a family and you go to a diy store and you choose out your kitchen and the cupboards <laughs> and everything like this but it is that on the most luxurious scale possible i mean dan you know which most people don't how everything is an option yeah literally everything there's things like for example the um, individual air vents which we have spoken about which i think are very valuable there's the types of window shades you can choose exactly where you want to put the lavatories and how many and how big are they going to be are they going to have a window just looking at the lavatory there's even a million things do i want a pedal to open the trash or do people need to push down do i want a japanese style bidet which is amazing when airlines have that one thing i was reading about today because i don't know if you're bothered by this alex but the worst thing for me on planes, if I had to choose one thing that would make the experience so much better, it's how dry the air is. Doesn't matter the aircraft yeah. type, even A350s and 787s, the air just makes my eyes itch. It makes my throat dry. I can't be drinking like three liters of water because I'll be going to the toilet every 15 minutes. So the only other option is to increase the humidity. And I just learned today, I was reading about it, that apparently many airlines do have humidifiers, but only in the cockpit and the crew rests, which I found fascinating. Interesting. Interesting. I mean, it is better on an A350, don't get me wrong. And doing the recent ultra long hauls, Montreal and then LA so soon after, and the difference between a 777 and a 350 is completely evident. So... It is better. But to, to, to go back to how, yeah, you can you can customize it. My favorite place at Airbus's headquarters in Toulouse is something known as the Customer Definition Center, the CDC, because that is <laughs> literally CDC. where you, the CDC, you not you're, to be confused with COVID the whole Fauci. And... <laughs> no, 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 no. Basically, you arrive to the CDC and usually Stop outside the CDC, the CDC, you'll see like a a, a con CDC. You'll see like a convoy of black Mercedes Vianos because the customer airline is in town and they'll emerge and go into the CDC and you have life size mock ups of every aircraft, starting from the 319, ranging all the way up to very recently to the A318. They've just taken the A380 out. No. And you board these full A380s or A350s, A330 Neos and so on. And Airbus show you everything that is possible to have in this aircraft and more. I mean, there's even more in the catalogs. Now you can't take photos inside. I've been in these aircraft in the CDC hundreds and hundreds of times, both in a consultancy capacity, when I was doing a few bits with a, an airline that was purchasing aircraft, and also on a media side. And 
when you enter, the level of options is actually a little bit depressing because you can only conclude. <laughs> you see what's well, then, missing. Why the hell does 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 not? Why the hell does every other aircraft that's actually flying not look like this? You know, because <laughs> Airbus are able to make it, and Boeing, of course, Airbus are able to make it look absolutely incredible in terms of the experience, the lighting, the fact that the different sidewall panels don't just have to be plain white, Beige, or they don't have to yeah. be. Next time, next time you fly Lufthansa and you look at the sidewall panel, which is basically the cabin wall, okay, that the window <laughs> sits on, that, that side frame. Look at those tiny grey dots. There's a million grey dots. And ask a who thought that was a good idea. grey dots. Yes. Oh, that's, that's what we want as travellers. Some, uh, you know, we, to feel optimistic and in a good place. We want grey dots. Great. You <laughs> know, that, has, but like, that was a choice. dune kind of patterns, which I love. But don't you think that looks a bit zebra -y? <laughs> it looks a bit retro, but comparing that yeah. to the gray dots or what most airlines have, of I think course. it's at least yeah. it's something different and it's more calming. Yeah. So you've got you can have brush stroke where basically it's, you know, the same color, but you can just see some kind of thin brush stroke textures along. You know, as I say, everything is an option. For the overhead lighting, on something like an A350, there are 17 million different lighting options in, and different settings. So I was with Philippine Airlines on the first ever A350 delivery to Manila and Philippine Airlines had a great consultant that ultimately helped with the design of their cabin and convinced them to go all out with the lighting. And they were able to display on the vast overhead compartments and the overhead ceiling space of the A350 because there was no central overhead lockers in business class they were able to do firework displays so wow. bursts of light it, it's on my twitter and what i'll do is i'll put it again so that anyone listening to the podcast now can have a look at it amazing what a novelty thin air of course, use yeah. this really cleverly from very early on with, and I'll let you do this one because you are the, the local. Well, Iceland Air also has a similar thing. It's basically northern lights. Yeah. Some airlines also have stars in the ceiling, which I love yeah. when they turn off yeah. the lights and you just see stars above you. Amazing. And then you can move into another room and it's uh, it's all glass, it's super modern in the CDC and you, you, you're presented with loads of different curtains and the team from the airline or the private individual, depending on who's ordering, will look at those curtains and they'll be assessing how heavy is it, how soundproof is it, because curtains play an important role in, in dividing up the sound between cabins and also absorbing up some engine noise. How does this curtain react? Is it going to be able to be pinned on either side to ensure that passengers can't pass, for example, from economy into premium economy? Is it going to be a little bit see-through to comply with US regulations? Because on the US, you can't have the le level of thickness with the curtains as you can in the rest of the world post 9-11. The carpets, how does the carpet react to a coffee spill? You know, it's part of the reason why a lot of aircraft don't have beige seats. Beige is typically a nice color that we see in hotels and lobbies and so on. It's not really so common on aircraft because it's a nightmare to be cleaned. And then you go even deeper into the detail and you say, okay, what are the seat models available? And Dan, someone like you, when you go onto an aircraft, you can tell, oh, this is the same seat model that was chosen by another airline. By a million and it's off the shelf. Airlines. So for example, give me a seat model that you would you would see often. Well, the you, reverse herringbone. Try. And and the thing I have to say right. about the reverse herringbone, it has many different manufacturers. If you don't know, it's basically the business class seat that it's just all like one seat by the window that angles in toward the window. So here, one thing that's been like driving me crazy over the past year is all these airlines hyping up their revolutionary new business class seat. Like for months, they'll be like coming soon and show little snippets. And then when they finally unveil it, it's another reverse herringbone, but with a door. And I'm just like, you hyped this up as something innovative when literally half of airlines are introducing this. Exactly. And that's that's the other thing. Not only do airlines have an extensive variety of options when it comes to the seat model, when it comes to customizing that seat, when it comes, but also airlines are not forced to take things off of the shelf. It's far easier to order out of the catalog, but you've got some airlines that work five, six, seven years to heavily customize what was six years ago an ordinary seat 
and turn it into something incredible. And this is how the likes of Singapore Airlines A380 cabins were born. This is how the likes of the Q Suite on Qatar Airways was born with the design company Priceman Good and so on and so on. So it's amazing just how far. There are no limits. I remember doing the Rwanda delivery, so the National Airline of Rwanda, and it was a delivery from Toulouse to Kigali, and they had chosen the Thompson Vantage XL seat, which I mm-hmm. think I'm correct in saying is the business class seat on Scandinavian Airlines 330. That's right. Yes, among others. Okay. So this seat is super comfortable. I like it a lot. I think it was a fantastic decision of Rwanda with Airbus for their first A330 to have such a solid business class seat model. And they had chosen a very nice premium economy seat. And they had chosen a long haul economy seat that was very new and also super comfortable in terms of the latest generation in flight entertainment. And when you recline, you know, that little bottom part that you're that you're sitting on goes forward a bit and so on and so on they did really well they customized the cabin with different designs a design known as imigongo which is a local design that you see a lot in rwanda but the funny part is is that the airline said that the seat the seat that you are familiar with on scandinavian airlines wasn't comfortable enough wasn't soft enough wasn't didn't have that bounce so they said it's beautiful but we can't get cozy so then they bring in another supplier called Octospring, where they're able to open up the seat and place these foamy springs inside of the seat itself, inside of the seat cushion, so that then when you sat down, oh, it was like a warm hug. I mean, nice. I slept so well to Kigali on that delivery. And it's just, you know, it's just an example of how far it can go. There are no limits. Yeah. It's it's exciting and also depressing to think how little we get of all the possibilities. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the revolutionary ways that are able to make economy class more comfortable with different new innovations that are always debuted year in, year out at these conferences that I know I used to attend a lot. I've slowed down a little bit in terms of the number of conferences I go to. I know that, Dan, I used to see you at some of them as well. The reality is, is that airline margins are so tight while everything is an option, they're like, you know what, put in 186 seats and if you can get six more by ripping out the lavatory, wonderful. <laughs> and passengers are still going to pay despite the fact that you are sat on something that is more akin to an ironing board. Yeah. Another thing airlines can choose, which I guess gets us into our next topic, is Wi-Fi, of course. How fast do they want it to be? Just this week, we had quite a big announcement. Actually, we had the biggest player coming out committing to installing Starlink Wi-Fi. So Starlink is Elon Musk's project, right, from the company SpaceX. And this Wi-Fi is proven to be able to give speeds up to 350 megabits per second on an aircraft while in flight. And that's the nice per part passenger. Is, is that per passenger, yeah. That's so the nice, the nice part is that in Doha, Qatar Airways now joins a small but growing list of airlines that have signed a deal with Starlink. So Qatar Airways, Air Baltic, JSX in the US, and Hawaiian Airlines, and there are a couple of others, have now signed these agreements that basically means that the aircraft will be equipped with Starlink Wi-Fi, which means that passengers will be able to use it from the get-go. So gate to gate. We're not talking about waiting for cruising altitude and wondering if we can then log on. It's the moment you board. 350 megabits per second for gaming, for VPN access, for sports streaming. This is a game changer. I can't wait for this. So I'm curious, do you know what the cost difference is for the airline? Well, not in actual I had numbers, a conversation. In- so... I had a conversation recently with Akbar Bakar, the group chief executive of Qatar Airways, and I was asking him why the airline didn't have live sports after the World Cup. So it did have it, have it during the World Cup, but since the World Cup, it's disappeared again. And also live news. I, I would, on many daytime flights, opt to put on live news and just have it on in the background while I'm working. And that would really make me feel like I was just the equivalent of being in an office. Um, but it doesn't. And he said that they knew that they didn't need it now because they had been forward planning this for quite some time, that they were going to take a mega Wi-Fi provider, and it now turns out to be Starlink, in order to ensure that all of that can just be streamed 
by ourselves on our own devices in addition to the extensive in-flight entertainment content and the fact that the airline's own press release mentions vpn access you know gaming sports streaming yeah. i thought was significant because they are basically saying go for it not what we typically expect historically with how it works with airlines where this is off limits don't stream this you'll use it all up it's going to cost you a lot and so on and so on i will tell you dan recently i had an amazing wi-fi experience on air canada it was, really? it was super fast. It did not drop out. Seven hours. It was amazing. Gate to gate. I, ca I can't remember, but some flights I have been able to stream YouTube, obviously without Starlink. So we'll see yeah. what happens when, when this is introduced. I am a bit hesitant to be like, woo, amazing. Because as we know, most airlines, we spoke about this in episode one, love to announce a huge, exciting initiative, something crazy like this, free Wi-Fi for everyone. But the question is, when will they install it? How fast? And many times we don't see it fleet wide. We see it on a few types of aircraft. It might be on a few routes, like the routes you fly, Alex, like to London or, or wherever it may be. But then people in many secondary markets might miss out, which is always a shame. Of course, of course. So the consistency is key. And that's also what we're hoping for. But you did touch on something that I actually didn't mention, which is that at least in the case of Qatar, the Wi-Fi is going to be completely free for everyone on board. That's also pretty game changing. So here's hoping that that consistency is something close to fleet wide. As a passenger, Dan, if you're presented with two similar fares, but one of them is able to offer you complimentary Starlink from gate to gate, I think I know what you're taking. <laughs> Yeah, but people need to know that it's offered too, which I think that's part of the challenge. Because right now, yeah, for example, Google Flights or all these flight sale websites don't actually show if Wi-Fi is free or not, which it is already on some yeah. other airlines. So that's that might yeah. be a future search setting we see. Definitely. Dan, there is a development with Fly Dubai. Fly Dubai. What? Uh, uh. Um, yeah, Fly Dubai. I saw this. They're launching flights again to Kabul. And this really took me by surprise. Kabul is, of course, the capital of Afghanistan. There are still a lot of questions for me. I don't know if you have the answers, Alex, but since the Taliban takeover and the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, no foreign airlines have flown to the country for a variety of reasons, but a big one is that insurers will not cover the airlines and their aircraft if they choose to fly there. So my question is, what is different for Fly Dubai that suddenly they can launch flights twice daily with brand new 737 MAX aircraft that makes them comfortable doing so? Ultimately, Fly Dubai is returning to Kabul, Kabul in full control by the Taliban, but and this is, the, this is the big but, the airport and most of the aviation sector in Afghanistan is now being managed with a group led by the UAE. So when the withdrawal of the US took place and Taliban resumed control of Afghanistan, pretty soon after, the Taliban were quite literally wondering, where are the airlines? Nobody's coming back. And how are I they going why. to, yeah, and how are they going to move ahead like this? What do they need airlines to do? And airlines were unable to return for a whole load of security reasons, not least because they couldn't be insured to go there in the first place. So then they ultimately said that they would be willing to let go of control of the aviation sector if they were going to hand it to an experienced regional neighbor. And uh, Qatar were looking at this, Turkey we're looking at this, then Qatar and Turkey together, and the United Arab Emirates. And the UAE was successful in their, basically a bid to the Taliban. And now the UAE and the aviation authorities across the UAE are managing most of the aviation sector in relation to Kabul, at least, and the international airport in terms of ground handling, in terms of the provision of air traffic control. So basically, it's unsurprising that Fly Dubai is going to be the first airline to return because you've basically got air traffic control being controlled by the UAE. You have the, the airport operations at the international airport of Kabul in full control, pretty much, of the UAE and the airport authorities that are based in the UAE. And, and also down to as small as the ground handling and who's going to be interacting with the aircraft while it's on the ground, you know, preparing it for its uh, final arriving position, preparing it for departure and so on and so on. So they seem to have got a point now, two years since the withdrawal, 
that they now have been able to certify and sign off for Fly Dubai to bring a 737 MAX over to Kabul. Let's see if any non-Emirati airlines follow, because as I say, this is really a product of the UAE aviation sector anyway, Mm. operating it. I think it will be far more significant when we see a non-Emirati airline flying to Kabul, because they will not have the same level of assurances that the Emiratis right now are able to give to their own low-cost branch fly Dubai. But I think that from what I have heard and from what some sources on the ground have told me, and I've been in touch with them since this all went down a couple of years ago, the Emiratis have done a pretty good job in Kabul, in securing it and in, in preparing the airport for a return of international activity. And and this is positive on the whole because it does mean that humanitarian aid, food, cargo and so on will be able to flow better into the international airport. This is the priority. And it's, you know, there, there is a poverty across Afghanistan since the withdrawal, especially. They have incredibly tough winters. So I hope that we do see a return from other foreign carriers, assuming it's safe to do so. And that's something that those airlines will decide in their conversations with the UAE. In these situations, I always think about the crew that have to operate those flights because... Personally, I would not be thrilled even to do a return flight to Kabul. There's many other cities where this applies or many places you fly over. I'm sure you've you've thought the same thing, that mm, that can't be a fun flight to see on your roster. I think that it would always appear like that to us. But when I speak to my friends that are pilots or crew, honestly... I think most of them think it's just not a big deal, that they think that the hard work is done. If the airline has cleared them to be able to operate there, then they have cleared so many hurdles, given how tight regulation is in aviation, that it's really not for the pilots to now start wondering and questioning the safety of it. They'll be making their own assessments and judgments as they do with everywhere that they fly. But I think it's not something that they think about too much. I mean, I remember speaking to the pilots and crew that were literally flying into Kabul when the Taliban was overthrowing the Afghan government once the US left, you know, in that crazy week in August 2021. And they were saying that it was wild and it was upsetting and it was crazy, but they knew that there were several assurances in place that meant that they wouldn't have been cleared to go there in the first place had it have been too dangerous. I mean, but then, you know, yeah. things do things do and can go wrong. So yeah, I do get the level of, of concern. Just a recent example that had me freaked out was when the war broke out in Sudan, I guess in the beginning of this year, there was yeah. a huge story in the aviation world and in the news about the airport being bombed. And at the time, there was one Saudi A330 on the ground. It was just doing a yes. turnaround. The crew would have just, you know, gone there and gone back from Khartoum. Of course, everyone's talking about what does this mean for the passengers? My thought is, what does this mean for this poor crew that was just doing their job, happened to have the city as their destination of the day, and suddenly their plane, as they're preparing to depart back home, gets destroyed by a bomb. They were hiding in the terminal, terrified of what was going to happen to them. And of course, in a situation like that, I'm extra worried because this is not Air France, where 99% of crew members, probably 100, are French citizens, the ones based in Paris. This is an airline that hires mainly foreign citizens, or almost exclusively So do they have the same incentive to spend a fortune repatriating Filipinos and Indians and people who just happen to be working for the airline? That's something I worry about. And I'm really glad they ended up taking cover in the Saudi embassy and ended up being flown back to Saudi eventually. But what a horrifying experience just for a day at work. And, and, you know, they, they had taken off that morning as expecting business as usual. And of course, it was anything but by the time they landed. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's enough scary stuff for today. Let's go into the Q&A. Okay, this question is from Joseph. He sent the question via Instagram and he says, Alex and Dan, great podcast. I tune in every week. My question is this. Did either of you do the unaccompanied minor thing when you were kids? (laughs) When did you first fly alone? You go first. I actually started flying alone when I was 15, because before that, my dad would fly with us to go to the US because it would just, it's already enough to travel 
just on your own. If you have a three year younger sibling and you're taking a you know 12 hour trip with a connection, even if you're an unaccompanied minor, that's a lot. So when I turned 15, when I was not technically an unaccompanied minor, but my little brother was on some airlines, we would do the unaccompanied minor thing. And then on some airlines, he actually wasn't considered that if he was traveling with someone over 15, which I'm like, that's crazy. So then we would just do it ourselves because we were experienced. But I think it's so fun. The airport staff who handle unaccompanied minors nine times out of 10, I'm in awe of how well they handle things, of how mm. nice they are and how comfortable they make the kids. I love to watch it even now, just seeing what a like lovely experience it is for the kid. They're, you're handled like a VIP when you're an unaccompanied minor. It's so true, so true. The first time I had flown fully alone as an unaccompanied minor, so basically where you are escorted by, as Dan said, somebody who's always super lovely, I was eight years old with British Airways wow. and it was from Athens to London Heathrow and to Terminal 1 and the flight left Athens you, you you're handed over for example I was handed over by my relative your relative cannot leave until the aircraft is airborne just in case you return to the gate and so on and so on and and they're not there so I remember saying goodbye to my auntie and to my grandmother and being taken with a BA lanyard that had this big square thing that said UM. <laughs> so I'm, I remember looking looking in the mirror in the bathroom and I've got this thing around my neck that says UM. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I'm taking this off. This is really, I knew what I was doing. I didn't even need the UM service. I knew the 767 that I was flying back to London on. I had to negotiate that I wanted a seat change because basically <laughs> when you back, the policy back then was if you're an unaccompanied minor, eight years old, you were seated in the last three rows of yes. the cabin on this huge 767. I didn't want to be sat at the back. I wanted to be near the front. And I wanted to at least be near the front of, you know, the, that cabin. It was and a comedy window all the way seat, through. I assume. And I wanted a window seat. But anyway, you, you couldn't. Rules are rules. Okay, fine. Fair enough. So, okay. So they, they get me a window seat, but it's going to be in the last row of the 767 with a lavatory very close <laughs> by. And when I was taken to the gate, I remember they sat me on the chair that was behind the chair that the gate agent will, was at the computer you printing out the, because back then it would print in some airports, it still does, the manifest and the load sheets. And it's making that noise, printing out all the documents. And she's saying, ladies and gentlemen, we're preparing for boarding in about 10 minutes. And I'm sat on that swivel chair, kind of spinning <laughs> around, waiting for boarding. And then they say that boarding is about to commence and everyone stands up and all business class are ready to, or everyone with status is ready to board and so on and so on. And they, she says, Alex, are you ready? And she takes my hand and um, I'm the first person to board. Imagine being eight years old, flying alone, big 767, empty. I was like, this is a dream. <laughs> so board and then get passed over to the cabin service director, so the purser of the flight, the head, and I say bye to the lady that was looking after me in Athens airport, hand it over to her, and she says, how are you? You know, what's your name? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'll take you to your seat. So she takes me all the way to the back of the aircraft, and I'm like making conversation. I mean, eight-year-old Alex was very similar to 26-year-old Alex and her in terms of talking non-stop about aviation and being super <laughs> conversational and so on. <laughs> and I settle in with my routine and get my things out. And then I'm wondering who I'm going to be sat next to. And this is what's interesting is that back then, at least with British Airways, an unaccompanied minor could not be sat next to a man. That was the oh. policy. You had to be, you were seated next to a woman and the woman would have been informed at check-in and basically asked if it's okay that she was going to be sitting next to and she was going to be a babysitter for three hours it's, 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 it's funny isn't it right so so this this family make their way to the back of the aircraft and they're like looking over at me and smiling and I'm thinking <laughs> what's happening and then, then they adopted, start saying honey. they start they start saying like he's there like you know to their auntie and their mother and that basically one of the the ladies in the family she's still making her way down the aisle and she comes and she says, hi. She said, you must be my little seatmate for the flight. <laughs> and I said, hi. She said, what's your name? I said, I'm Alex. And she said, her name was Janice. And she sits down. She tells me she's a teacher. I mean, how 
for British Airways, perfect is this. So I'm yeah. I'm an eight year old unaccompanied minor now sat next to a teacher, and she <laughs> was asking me, "What were you in Athens for? You were with your family and so on." And we were speaking and speaking and speaking. She introduced me to the rest of the family that was sat around us. Do I need and anything? That, Am I nervous? Am I scared? And that is how you met your mother. <laughs> no, shush. <laughs> anyway, my mother was waiting for me in Spain. I was going to London and then to Spain, and when we flew. We were watching, she swapped with me, so I gave her the window seat so I could see the overhead screen. And they were playing a really old movie, something about a zoo. And it was on the overhead screens of the 767, <laughs> you know, with the fuzziness because it wasn't in HD and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, super memorable. You arrive, you get handed over to the arrival person and she escorts you. Another also really nice, lovely older lady. And she takes you all the way, all the way. And then you stand in arrivals and she's like, which one is your, your relative or your father or your mother? So you point and then they, they cross check all the documents and then you're released back into the wild. That was my <laughs> first, my first UM experience. I first flew alone, alone as a normal passenger without UM when I was 14, because that was the legal age I could do so with EasyJet at the time. Mm. You could be 14 and just board as a passenger. And the day I turned 14, whew, I was out. I saved my money. I went to Copenhagen and I didn't exit what? the airport. I just transit there and came back. Yeah. As a true av geek, the one thing I just one spent of the, six hours in the terminal. One of the first times I did it with my brother. the The good thing, as you said, is that when you you become kind of a VIP, you get to board first. So we were transiting in Amsterdam on KLM, and our agent who was taking care of us goes, "Have you boys ever watched the Victoria's Secret fashion show?" And I'm like, "No, but why are you talking to my 12 year old little brother about that?" What? <laughs> and then he's like, "Well, one of their most." Most iconic models, Dutzen Kuz, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. She will be on your flight. And since we, she had VIP services, we were boarding as UMs. We got to meet her. So I knew of her <laughs> and I had seen her in the Victoria's Secret fashion show. So I was like, yeah, I'm a celebrity because I'm boarded with her. I thought that was fun. <laughs> it is this, it's, an, it's an underworld, isn't it, of air travel, the underworld of the UMs. That are, you know, there's this level of respect. It's like you're a kid, you're alone. It's really rare to see unaccompanied minors on flights nowadays, but... But it, it is still a service that exists at a lot of airlines. I can't remember if BA still have it. I think they scrapped it. I'll check now, but I'm sure that the service was called Skyfly Solo. And I am sure they scrapped it. Children under 13 cannot travel alone with us. They must be accompanied by someone age 16 or over. Yeah, they scrapped it. Wow. Oh, here we go. In 2020, the end of our Skyfly Solo service. Yeah. That's terrible. Lufthansa still does yeah. it. I know that for a fact. I just The Europeans have always been more more like progressive in terms of having these big schemes and they always had more demand and yeah. you always see it on like a Lufthansa group or Iberia. Well, before we wrap up, there is just one thing we can't forget to do, the giveaway. We're going to announce yes. our first winner. As you guys giveaway. might know, if you've listened to previous episodes, if you leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll be entered. Of course, you have to send us a screenshot of, of your review on Instagram or wherever you want you will be entered to win. So we have our first winner. What are you winning? Well, you'll win a variety of prizes, including some first class airline amenity kits. So our first winner, drum roll, Alex. <laughs> Timran472, that's the Instagram username. I'll be messaging you to get your address. And we will come to your house and deliver it personally. No, I'm just kidding. But what? <laughs> Alex, we're taking a trip. You can. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's going to show up in the mail. Uh, thank you, all of you, for your very kind words and uh, for very tuning nice. in again. It. We look forward to seeing you next week on air. I'm Alex. That's Dan. Safe Bye -bye. travels. See you later. See ya.